Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Spath, and I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're a voice of conscience for peace, justice, human rights, and intercultural encounter. I'm also a member of the Palestine-Israel Network of the United Church of Christ and a member of the Global Kairos for Justice Coalition. Robert, it's, uh, it's really, really good to see you. Uh, we're delighted today to speak with our friend, UK commentator, Micah's paradigm shift and a recent master's student. Uh, and I'll let him tell you about that, uh, Robert Cohen. Welcome, Robert. Mike, thank you very much. It's lovely to be um, talking to you again and seeing you. And I have uh, very fond memories of my time in Fort Wayne a few years ago and the and the and the uh, the tour of the midwest which you helped to organize for me you were and on your way to uh, you were on your way to texas i remember we, we planned a tour for you i was you heading to do a fest shift for our buddy mark ellis a absolutely right and um it was it was a, a wonderful experience the whole the whole trip to the states uh and i remember just how hospitable you were to me in fort wayne and and what a uh, what a great audience we had at your church uh, when I spoke there, and uh, so it's 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 lovely to be invited back, even even if it's kind of via Zoom. <laughs> um, I know you have a number of friends on this call today, so just why don't you uh, let us know what you're up to these days and how you and your family are doing uh, during this COVID crisis of the last year? Yeah, well, I mean, like like um, an awful lot of people all, all around the world, you know, my my life has been disrupted and, and changed because of COVID-19. And I'm very fortunate to be able to say that you know, I, I've been well and my immediate family have all been, uh, have all kept well as well. Uh, I've got my first COVID jab tomorrow morning. So I'm uh, excited about that. But um, uh, the, one, the one kind of bad thing I guess that did happen is that um, I ended up being made redundant from my the work I'd been doing my employer for the last 15 years. And that was a kind of COVID related cost cutting restructure, which I'm sure a lot of people have um, either heard about or experienced. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of changing, changing my life, really. Uh, and I decided to take the opportunity to have a bit of a career break. Uh, and I started a full time politics MA. So I'm now back to being a full-time student, which I'm loving. And uh, it's giving me some real focus and structure. And um, perhaps not surprisingly, I've decided to focus my, uh, my studies on Israel-Palestine, um, partly because I've got, I've got all the books. You know, they're, they're all behind <laughs> me. So I wanted, to, I wanted to make good use of them. So, um, so, so these days I'm a student. Um, I, am, um, uh, I, I noticed the photograph that you put on me on Facebook I was looking very dapper in my suit and a nice haircut, and and at the moment I feel I'm looking very dishevelled. This is this is my kind of um, cliche COVID lockdown um, appearance, but I'm I'm looking forward to the first opportunity to get a haircut, which is on the 12th of April in the UK. I have I've already booked it in. <laughs> Wonderful, Robert. My and your wife, uh, your wife uh, uh, is an Anglican priest. Ha ha yeah. Have. Uh, What's the church situation like uh, uh, in uh, the UK? Well, during uh, the beginning of the first lockdown last spring, the, church, the churches here were all, all did have to close. Uh, and and uh, like lots of other people went online uh, in, in, in a big way. And, uh, and it was a kind of very fast, uh, steep learning curve about how to, uh, how to put services and how to support people online but also how to respond in very practical ways in the local community uh, with things like sort of set, setting up uh, what we call sort of pop-up pantries, sort of food, food banks essentially uh, in, our, in our local town and trying to respond to the, some of the immediate needs and also thinking about just how you keep in touch with, with people that might already be quite isolated, uh, but were now even more isolated. So she, she's been working harder than ever. <laughs> Well, good. And somebody has to support you to the life you're used to, of course, now that you're a student again. Hey, listen, uh, I have so many questions for you, Robert, but let's dig uh, right away into your article from earlier this month. We need to decolonize our understanding of anti-Semitism. So uh, to review, 
the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, the IHRA, recently adopted this definition of anti-Semitism and in, in turn considered and adopted by the Biden administration and various European governments. And let me just read it. Anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews which may be expressed as hatred toward Jews. Rhetorical and physical manifestations of anti-Semitism are directed toward Jewish or non-Jewish individuals and or their property, toward Jewish community institutions and religious facilities. So we'll get into the specific examples they give, Robert, and you identify a couple of them in your, in your article. But Give us some of your general thoughts right now about uh, this definition that's caused really so much the storm and drong among us activists, you know? Yes, I, I, mean, I think uh, what's happened with the IHRA and the way that it's been uh, championed, particularly by um, advocates for, for Israel, and I'm, and I'm talking about sort of professional institutional bodies um, who have been certainly in the United Kingdom in really kind of pushing this document. Uh, and over here, um, you've had the Board of Deputies of, of British Jews, which is the main kind of uh, community institution. Um, and they were successful in getting the government here to adopt it and then subsequently uh, putting um, a great deal of sort of lobbying pressure on other organisations, whether they're trade unions or other political parties, um, and educational institutions in particular uh, to adopt it. Um, and they've been backed in that by the Secretary of State for Education here, who's written various letters to vice chancellors of universities saying, if you don't adopt this document, uh, then you are risking your, your institutional funding from the government. So, you know, it's really kind of putting the screws on. Um, but IHRA here is certainly... Um, I would say kind of dominated the the discourse on on, on Israel Palestine uh, and and done that thing that we all find very frustrating is that you, you want to talk about uh, Israel Palestine you want to talk about Palestinian rights and then you very quickly find that you're talking about anti-Semitism which is not to say that anti-Semitism isn't important yeah um, but but uh, and it's real and it's a and it's a, a growing issue and we should be concerned about it. Um, but it can be frustrating when um, you start talking about Palestine and Israel and what's happening to Palestinians on the ground. And then suddenly you find yourself having an argument about what is the nature of anti-Semitism. Uh, and, I, and I think, you know, um, many of the people who are, I'm sure, watching our, our conversation here will be very familiar with that phenomenon. Um, and, uh, and, and of course, you know, I think that it's, sort of part of the strategy of, it, is, of Israel advocacy is to try and turn the debate onto anti-Semitism. Uh, and the IHRA document, because it, but you know, we, we, we're not going to get more onto this, but because it brings in so many illustrations that relate to Israel, you suddenly find yourself you know, in a conversation about anti-Semitism when you're wanting to talk about Israel. Yeah, and that's, uh, uh, we're going we're gonna to get, we're going to dig deep now into the IHRA definition, but that's also, even though it's progress, that's also, I, I hear the concern about this, the Jerusalem Declar Declaration on anti-Semitism too. While that's really a, a major step forward, it reframes the whole debate. So like you say, once you want to talk about Palestinian rights, you're immediately thrown back to talking about anti-Semitism. So I, I we'll, we'll get into the Jerusalem Declaration in a minute. Let's... Okay. But, but thank you for that. that. That's an important distinction that you make. So let's let's talk about these two examples. And I'd like for you to take each one. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll mention the two that you give in, in, in your article. And then if you need me to repeat the second one, that's fine, too. But uh, out of the 11 examples of these of anti-Semitism, you identify these denying the Jewish people their right to self-determination, for example, by claiming that the existence of the state of Israel is a racist endeavor. And the second example that they give that you highlight, applying double standards by requiring of it 
a behavior not expected or demanded of any other democratic nation. Yeah, what could go wrong with those, right? Uh, yeah, go ahead. That, exactly. Take, um, take it away. Well, on, 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 the, on the first one, I mean, I guess the thing that, um, uh, that I find is, is clearly troubling about the, uh, the, the one that um, talks about, you know, not being able to talk about as well as a racist endeavor. I mean, I, I always want to sort of um, counsel against people who just simply sort of, you know, broadly want to say Zionism is racism. Uh, and, and the reason I say that is because I think um, when I think about Zionism, I, I think it's there are two things going on here. I, I do think that it is um, a project of national self-determination um, uh, on behalf of, uh, of the Jewish people. And it was born out of an experience of anti-Semitism in Europe. Um, and at the same time, I think it is a, um, a settler colonial enterprise that has displaced um, uh, an, uh, an indigenous people, the Palestinian people. And two things, can, and both those things can be true. You know, it can, um, something could be more than one thing, as my, 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 my kids always like to say to me. Um, and and this, is, this is absolutely a case of that. You know? And so you, I don't think you can have a situation anymore where you can say that, you know, the definition of Zionism um, uh, can only be made by a, a, a particular group of Jewish people, you know, usually an, an elite group of in, institutional Jewish people, who, who get to say what Zionism is, is or isn't. I think if you if you want a rounded understanding of, of that ideology and what it's meant and how it's actually played out through history, then you have to include the experience of Palestinians. Uh, and if you talk to um, Palestinians, then they might absolutely fear, fairly say, you know, their experience of it, um, both now in the moment and, and over time through their own family's experience, has been that it's been essentially a racist endeavour. So al although I would want to say that Zionism is more than just racism, it's a lot of other things as well, I think to deny or suggest that somebody cannot express it in those terms is, is deeply problematic um, and ignores uh, one group of people's you know, lived experience of, of, of that ideology. Let, let, me, let me follow up on that. I, I'm, I'm glad you, you raised this because uh, I highlighted this in your article. I mean, I'm, I'm gonna, it's almost a repetition of what you just said. Zionism has been and still is a Jewish liberation movement born out of a desire to escape anti-Semitism, uh, a national self-determination in the form of the Jewish state, though, is not the only way to achieve this. However, it's also been, and still is, a project of settler colonialism, which has led directly to the dispossession and continued oppression of the Palestinian people. They coexist simultaneously. And I guess I would, I, that's, I, I guess I was a, a surprise to, uh, to to read that. Just knowing, um, uh, I mean, I understand what you're saying, but would you characterize yourself? I mean, you, you're you're certainly not a liberal Zionist, uh, um, and I know that JVP here in this country struggled for months, nay, years on their recent, uh, uh, of a couple of years ago, book about being anti-Zionists or non-Zionists at best. So how do you characterize yourself and, and say a little bit more about this sentence and what you just said? Spell it out a little bit yeah. more for us. Okay. Um, well, I'm, I mean, I, I, I certainly wouldn't describe myself as a Zionist. Uh, and, I, and, and I've got to this point through a long journey. So, you know, if I think about sort of where I was when I was sort of at, at university the first time around, you know, my early 20s, that I was probably a liberal Zionist in those days. Um, and and, uh, and I, I guess around 15 years ago, or ago, I would have probably got to the point where I thought I, I'm not really a Zionist. Um, and I guess I, I could use the term anti-Zionist. Um, there's something kind of, there's something about that I kind of don't, don't quite like only because maybe I don't like the word anti or but, but um, maybe I'm better described as a, a post-Zionist or somebody that wants to just move beyond Zionism to something, yeah. to an understanding of Jewish identity and, and indeed faith 
that is more that is you know that is genuinely inclusive and that is genuinely interconnected with the experiences of other other peoples um and i see zionism as as it's the phase of jewish history that we are currently living in you know so if i think about the long sort of sweep of jewish history we are currently in a, a phase that's clearly called zionism and, and zionism has been incredibly successful um, in kind of integrating and merging itself with just about every kind of expression experience of, of modern Jewish identity. And, and, and that's happened for a number of reasons that we could, you know, we could go into if we have time. Um, and I, I guess I feel like I am part of a, a project, uh, you know, a kind of you know, a, a loose collective of, of many individuals and organisations that are looking to find a way to the next phase of Jewish history. Um, that, that, that will be kind of take us beyond Zionism, that will recognise that clearly you cannot just kind of ignore Zionism. You know, it, we, we all have to, re, we all find ourselves reacting to it. You know, the Jewish, uh, the Jerusalem Declaration on Antisemitism you mentioned that finds it has to address itself to a, to a, to a preset discourse. And so everything we do is always in relation to Zionism and to what exists already. Um, but I think the, the project I hope that I'm part of in, in the way that I write and, and how I want to connect myself to many, many other Jewish people around the world is to find a way through to a different phase, a new phase, a kind of post-Zionism, a beyond Zionism, uh, where we can think differently about our, our history and how we interpret it, how we can think differently about our relationship to critically the Palestinian people, but also to other, other peoples as well. I keep thinking as you're talking uh, um, about, uh, you know, Mark Ellis talking about uh, the, we're at the end now of Jewish ethical history. I also think of us who are on the call here who are Christians, um, Bon Hafer and his letters and papers from prison and his uh, unfinished ethics talking about a world come of age and just, you know, I think many religious traditions now are, are, are seeing themselves as part of a global movement and not, not as tribal, uh, to, you know, as, as each one of us uh, war, were and still are in so many respects. Let, let, me, let me ask you about the second example that you uh, highlight about applying double standards. Do you want me to read the whole thing or applying double standards? Well, yeah. Requiring no. of it a behavior not expected or demanded of any other democratic nation. Uh, and, and there's a number of ways that you need to kind of uh, critique that particular example. Uh, I mean, to take, a, to take, you know, let me, let me take the first one. I think uh, the art, the art, first of all, you know, there's, there's a implicit, explicit claim there that, you know, Israel is a democracy. Yeah. Uh, and, and uh, you know, that, that it's a, it's a, it's a at best, you know, it's a partial democracy, or you could say it's a democracy if you're Jewish. Uh, so maybe it's a kind of ethno democracy in some way. Um, but the one, the one thing um, it isn't is the is the thing that it constantly claims that it that it, that it states that it that it is, which is that it's a kind of Western style liberal democracy. Um, but um, it's not because it isn't the nation of of uh, all its citizens. It's the it's the the nation state of the Jewish people around the world. Uh, and that's a different way of thinking about um, citizenship and nationality and democracy than you have in the United States or in Western Europe. So, so the, the example, first of all, you have to kind of interrogate uh, what's really meant here by democracy and is democracy what's being experienced by Palestinians, whether they're citizens within Israel proper or whether they're in the West Bank or East Jerusalem or Gaza. Uh, and the, the one thing you can say is that, you know, wherever they are, they do not have the same rights and entitlements um, or, or sort of institutional benefits as their Jewish neighbours. Uh, you know, and that's and that's the bottom line. Um, and, and I thought it was very important that um, uh, Beit Salem, the, the Israeli uh, human rights NGO, came out with their statement about apartheid in, back in January this year. Uh, and that was that was kind of, I think, um, an important moment 
in that you had a a a, a Jewish Israeli led organization saying something that frankly the Palestinian people have been saying for a long time but you know because this debate is always skewed towards Jewish opinion um, it matters that Beit Salem are now saying it so that's the I guess that's the first point uh, on, on that sort of second example the other the other issue with it I think is to do with um, this idea that you know you can't say anything about Israel and you know until you've sort of condemned every other uh, awful state that might exist around the world. Um, and I, and I, that, that doesn't make sense to me. Uh, I mean, I think we, we all have reasons why we particularly focus on a, on a particular area or, the, or the, the troubles of the particular people. And there's usually a personal story that we all have that's brought us to a, to a particular cause and a particular place. Um, but I mean, but, but the idea that that means you're applying double standards because you don't criticise, you know, half a dozen other states in the same breath um, doesn't make any sense to me. And I, and I think it's an, un, an unreasonable uh, request. Let's, um, let, let, we're, I want to get to the, uh, the statement by Betselem, uh in, in a minute, but let, let's dig into this Jerusalem declaration on anti-Semitism. Um, it's critical of the IHRA definition. And as I said earlier, it really progresses the argument. There's a lot of good things to say about it. And yet just today in Mondo Weiss, right, there's kind of a Palestinian critique, an appreciative critique of the Jerusalem declaration. Tell, tell us your thoughts. Uh, uh, say a word about what it is and then uh, tell us your thoughts about it. Okay, well, and I mean, the Jerusalem Declaration, it, it, it only just appeared, I think it was last Thursday, um, and, um, and, it's had a, and it's had a lot of attention, well, it's had a lot of attention um, in some ways, and it's been clearly completely ignored uh, in, in, in other yeah. spaces. So it's been quite noticeable that, you know, I haven't seen it reported yet in the kind of Jewish press here in the UK. Um, uh, and I certainly haven't seen any kind of statement or comment on it by any of the kind of uh, Jewish institutional bodies here. So they're kind of wanting to pretend it hasn't happened. Uh, and I can understand why they want to do that, because they don't want to draw attention to it. Uh, because you here you've got a document that has clearly set out to en engage and critique and challenge the IHRA. Um, and, and, you know, personally, I think it, it does it very well. Uh, and it comes up with a, a much more uh, concise and easy to understand definition of anti-Semitism than the one that you read earlier from the IHRA uh, that's problematic in itself for various reasons. Um, and um, it's able to make the distinctions between uh, anti-Semitism and opposition to Zionism and Israel, which means you don't get into, you know, if you adopted it or you said, you know, this is going to be our kind of guidelines on this, um, you won't get into situations that mean you've, you, you're, you're, you're banning a, a, a BDS campaign or you're, you're, you're not allowing somebody to, to, to speak on, uh, on Palestinian issues on, on, a, on, a, on a campus. So, I, so I mean, I mean, and the, the useful thing about the document is that it's 200 um, very experienced, very knowledgeable Jewish scholars from around the world that have put their name to this piece right. of work. Uh, and it's very hard to um, to simply dismiss them, or you know, or, or or disregard them as being somehow you know just a bunch of kind of you know I don't know lefty anti-Zionists or troublemakers or people who are entirely unconnected to the Jewish community or you know these people have got serious credibility, uh, and I think the credibility of the people who have attached their names to this document is very important in itself. Uh, because it, it enables those of us who want to advocate for Palestine to be able to point to another document that has got some credibility because of the people who have associated themselves with it. You know, they are professors of Jewish studies. They are professors of anti-Semitism. They are professors of, of Middle Eastern studies. You know, they know what they are talking about. So I, so I think this is a very helpful intervention. Uh, however, I have also read... The, the various uh, Palestinian organization critiques. And, and I understand uh, exactly where they're coming from. And I can understand the frustration that we're continuing to um, cite 
this debate about anti-Semitism within an Israel context all, all the time, um, and 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 that we don't get to a point where we talk about anti-Semitism in a, in a more kind of holistic way that situates it within within broader uh, debates and conversations about about racism around the world, and 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 I can understand that, that why they're raising those points, and I think they are valid points. And I think the only thing I would say in response is that the people who have drafted the, uh, the Jerusalem Declaration, um, they weren't coming to this, um, uh, they weren't started from scratch, you know, they weren't coming to this in a vacuum. They were clearly coming to it in response to a discourse that has already been set for us because of the IHRA and because of the way that um, uh, professional Jewish um, institutions, you know, who are advocating for Israel and wanting to defend Israel have chosen to use that, IHRA document, so that it's you know, if they were, if they'd started from scratch, I'm sure they would probably come up with a different sort of document, but they weren't. You know, they were clearly coming into an existing uh, debate space that's already, you know, sadly been set for us by the people who we, we are disagreeing with. So I think the reason that it is the way that it is, and the reason it that therefore has the flaws that are being pointed out, is because uh, this thing has uh, this thing has come about in a particular context. Yeah. We would encourage uh, all of our listeners, right, to take a look at the IHRA definition uh, of anti-Semitism and its criticisms, uh, um, as, as well as this Jerusalem Declaration on Anti-Semitism. And let me just read its definition of anti-Semitism. It's very simple and straightforward, right? Anti-Semitism is discrimination prejudice, hostility, or violence against Jews as Jews or Jewish institutions as Jewish. And so it conforms, right, to general definitions of racism, which is one of its uh, strengths. And as you pointed out, uh, things that are not considered anti-Semitic, and they're stated clearly in the Declaration, supporting the Palestinian demand for justice and full uh, 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 their, their full guarantee of political, national, civil, and human rights, criticizing or opposing Zionism as, as a form of nationalism, evidence-based criticism of Israel as a state. It's not anti-Semitic to compare Israel with other historical cases, including settler colonialism and apartheid, and BDS is supported as a, as a valid nonviolent form of political protest, and so it really does it really does uh, uh, um, present uh, uh, what uh, not even a more balanced but a, a really strong strong case I think right. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, I mean, even that initial um, uh, definition at the top. If you go back, I mean, one of my kind of bugbears with the IHRA. Um, 40 word definition before you even get to the illustrations that are problematic is that it's just it's just so awfully written it's just a kind of clumsy clumsy piece of work I mean I, I'm somebody that spent a career in you know kind of being a copywriter and a speech writer and you know and a, and, a, and, a, and a journalist so I get kind of het up about um, you know how people structure sentences and how they and, and how they kind of get their ideas across and I just thought could they not even have found a decent copywriter to knock this thing into shape <laughs> but 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 beyond, but beyond that, I think I actually think it's a very a very weak. The IHRA definition is very weak, um, which is which is odd considering it's sort of being championed as the as the sort of gold standard in defining anti-Semitism because it begins by talking about um, hatred towards Jews. I'm thinking, well, that that's not where anti-Semitism begins. You know, you're already way down the spectrum that's when right. you've got to when you've got to hatred. What what happened to kind of you know prejudice and hostility uh, and all the kind of, you know, microaggression and prejudice that, you know, that, that, that we can all think of. Uh, and instead it goes straight to hatred. I'm thinking, well, that's, that's not very helpful. That's not a good definition. We have a question from one of our friends here in Fort Wayne. Uh, a number of us in, in our area have been studying uh, the book Cast by Isabel Wilkerson. I don't know if you're aware of the book or not. But uh, um, the question is, is there any usefulness to view the situation with Israel-Palestine through the lens of caste and its purpose of power 
as described by Isabel Wilkerson. And uh, yeah. Well, um, I'm, I'm, I'm at a disadvantage because I don't know the book, um, okay. but, I, but, but, I, but I, was certainly, I certainly think that you have to, uh, you know, as somebody who is now a uh, full-time uh, politics student, you know, I think you always have to look at, you know, where is the power? Uh, and who has the power and who doesn't have the power and how is that power achieved? And, you know, and so as a kind of, as, as a basic kind of starting point for political analysis, um, uh, yeah, where is the power and how is it sustained? But I, I don't know whether that's getting to what Isabel Will, uh, you know, uh, Wilkinson is talking about. But I think we'd encourage you to uh, um, uh, take a look at the book. And if nothing else, there's a couple of very good YouTubes uh, uh, about 45 to 50 minutes long, John Meacham interviewing Isabel Wilkerson. And another one is uh, Eric Michael Dyson uh, uh, interviewing Isabel Wilkerson. And so those two uh, 45 to 50 minute YouTubes uh, would, be, uh, would be worth your while. I'm, I'm absolutely certain. Thank you, uh, I've, I've written that down. <laughs> your, the title of your article was, uh, we need to decolonize our understanding of anti-Semitism. So what do you mean by decolonizing? anti-Semitism. Tell us how to do that. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I was drawing on the work there of uh, um, uh, Alana Lentin, who's um, uh, an Australian academic who, who wrote a book last year called Why Race Still Matters. Uh, and uh, Alana Lentin, she... Say, she, say, she say, get, say that again, Robert. What was the name of the... It's um, Alana is the first name and Lentin, L-E-N-T-I-N, and her book was Why Race Still Matters. Okay. And she, 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 um, uh, she talked about the need to, to decolonize anti-Semitism. Um, and since then, I've actually seen it written about in, in another book by uh, Atal Atalia Omar called Days of Awe. Uh, and she also sort of talks about this as, a, as, a, as, a, as an idea. Um, at, um, a third book, uh, which I'd again reference in the, the end of the blog, um, is by Santiago uh, Slabotsky called yeah. Decolonial Judaism. Um, and uh, Santiago, who, who, who I met uh, at the conference that I went to for, for, Mark, for Mark Ellis. Sure. Uh, Santiago, he's a, he's a great guy and um, uh, um, um, a very accomplished a academic, um, and that's another another work that's worth uh, worth seeking out. But what 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 these writers are are exploring is um, is these ideas of you know how how do we uh, you know how has antisemitism itself become kind of about uh, become uh, bound up in colonial kind of activity? So if if you think and and Jewish and you know and indeed therefore Jewish identity, because if you if you define anti-Semitism in a particular way and you associate it with the particular things, uh, by implication, you're also beginning to define Judaism and being Jewish in those terms as well. Uh, and that was a point I was sort of trying to make at the start of that last blog post. Um, because if you, if you talk about anti-Semitism in ways that actually is enabling uh, the oppression or the you know the colonial uh, the colonialized uh, oppression of another people then you're suddenly turning you know the the, the, the very experience of being Jewish uh, and, and having a Jewish identity um, into something which is also kind of colonial uh, and I guess that was what I was trying to sort of get at and and, and what I'm finding very interesting at the moment in you know, the reading that I'm doing um, is I mean I'm very interested in in the, the the writers the scholars who are who are exploring you know, how do you shape a different understanding of of Jewish identity how do you shape a different understanding of, of anti-Semitism uh, of Jewish history even sort of how you develop Jewish liturgy you know people like Rabbi Brant Rosen in in, in uh, Chicago who are doing uh, uh, amazingly creative work in in looking at in, in developing new forms of liturgy. That, that, that are not um, shaped or, or, or can be used in ways that, uh, that effectively, you know, defend a settler colonial enterprise. So, that, so 
all, all these writers and thinkers are, are, are particularly kind of interesting to me at the moment, uh, and, and they're things that I'm looking to sort of pursue my studies on. You know, uh, um, what I really appreciate about the title and also your argument, Robert, is that you know, many of us, I'm looking on the call here, have been, have been doing this work for a while, and we've seen, I mean, decades, and there are people here who have been about this their whole lives because it's their lived reality. Um, but we've moved, right, from decades ago talking about this as a conflict to then uh, uh, occupation. But it's only been within the last, at least for m many activists, it's only been within the last decade and maybe even the last few years that we've really talked about settler, a settler colonial project. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, uh, in one of your end, in your end note, you also referenced uh, Jeff Halper's new book, mm -hmm. Decolonizing Israel, Liberating Palestine, Zionism, Settler Colonialism and the Case for the One Democratic State. So uh, to transition, uh, maybe uh, what do you think of one democratic state? It, it could be uh, Halper's program uh, and, and the Palestinians that are a, a part of that. Uh, it's a Palestinian-led one democratic state campaign or other one democratic state initiatives. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, I'm, 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 I'm very sympathetic to those, those ideas. And I'm very impressed by the work that Jeff, Jeff Halper and, and other people have been doing to, to, to really kind of flesh it out and put some detail around it. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I know my, my own hope would be that, you know, that, that the, the kind of the, the vision and the strategy that they're talking about is, is, is where, we, where we move on to. Um, I, I guess I also think, and I'm sure, you know, Jeff would acknowledge this, we're, we're a long way from it right now. And... Uh, and I usually think that the idea of um, uh, uh, a one-state solution is, is 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 just as unlikely as a two-state solution is as, as as things stand. So kind of it doesn't feel as if either of these possibilities have got much traction um, in terms of where we are right now. Um, and it feels almost you know often I feel as if the de the, the debate is al almost kind of not quite ready for it because we're still we still haven't actually got our heads around the fact that, you know, do we do, do we agree that we want equal rights for everybody living in that territory, or don't we? Uh, and it, you kind of feel as like you know that that has to be decided first of all. And if you think about you know um, uh, U.S. American foreign policy, you know, um, 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 well, undoubtedly under Trump, but also under Biden. Um, you know, they're, they're not there, you know, they're, they're not actually, they haven't actually accepted the, the, what you think that they would have no problem in accepting in terms of, you know, if you are a liberal democracy, which is what the, the United States um, hopes that it is, then, you know, why would you have a problem with calling for e e equal rights for everybody living in a sort of single territorial area under a single uh, jurisdiction? Um but but we still seem to have um, a huge difficulty in agreeing that point, and and, and until we've agreed that fundamental idea of uh, equality for everyone that you know calls the Holy Land home, um, and I'm I'm not sure that we're going to make much progress to to any sort of better constitutional arrangement. But you know, but yeah, I would you know I, I I'm I'm happy to sort of uh, pin my colours to. Uh, Jeff Halper's mast on this one, and I, 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 I would like to think that's the kind of direction that we end up going. Well, and uh, as Jeff would remind us too, it's important that, uh, and it is, that this be a, something that's Palestinian-led, right? Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that's right. I, I, I think, and I remember having this conversation with, with you and others in Fort Wayne as about, you know, the importance of the Palestinian people having having agency um, and determining um, th their their future in in the in the way that is right for them, uh, and we need to be um, allies in that endeavour. Um, but I think there's an additional role, I think, for uh, people like myself that are coming to this sort of Jewishly. And that I think we also have kind of particular, so if you like, sort of specific work to do 
which is about trying to have a kind of conversation within our own community that sort of pushes this on uh, and hopefully begins to shift some of the, 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 you know, the roadblocks that are in the way. And, and they're mostly kind of ideological road, roadblocks that I think will stop the Palestinian people um, a, a, a achieving what they, what they must achieve. You referenced before uh, the recent report by the Israel Human Rights Group, B'Tselem, and this is how you've written about it, Robert. What B'Tselem has done is recognize the power of language and its importance in creating the moral universe in which we live. Here's the key sentence laden with ethically explosive implications. In the, so this is what you've written. In the entire area between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River, the Israeli regime implements laws, practices, and state violence designated to cement the, supre the supremacy of one group, Jews, over another, Palestinians. In the NGO's view, it's, to it's time to call this by its proper name under international law, apartheid. So it's really about framing, right? I mean, uh, and, and B'Tselem's reports, its use of language. Yeah, to, to frame I, to frame the issue. Yeah, and I, you know, word, 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 words are words are very important, uh, and you know, and I, and I say that as somebody that's kind of made a career out of you know, putting words together one 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 way or another. Uh, and but I I think how we describe things and the narratives that are are created um, are, are critical to. Um, to people's understanding, and and uh, you know one of the reasons why when I first started blogging and I sort of chose to call my blog Micah's Paradigm Shift, you know it was this word. Uh, I was really struck by the word paradigm, you know, and the way that you know when you when you when you're in a paradigm, you don't know that you're in a paradigm. It's just the way you see everything, and it seems perfectly kind of reasonable and normal to you until somebody points out that there's something problematic about it, um, and you know, and the shift. The shift that I want that I wanted to sort of be part of when I talked about you know Micah's paradigm shift, and I'm referring to you know a Hebrew prophet there in Micah, is is this recognizing that uh, for for most uh, most Jewish communities around the world, you know they they kind of don't see that there's a problem here. They 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 are, they are not willing to confront just how serious is the the issue. That the the project of Zionism has actually created in, in the way that it's worked out, um, and until uh, until I guess you know more people um, face into the reality of what has taken place and the relationship it has created between Israeli Jews and Palestinians, and then as a consequence, the 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 relationship between the Jewish diaspora and Israel and Palestinians. Um, and until people kind of really open their eyes and understand what is going on here, um, we're not we're not going to make progress because you have to kind of break out of that paradigm. Uh, and paradigms are created by by words and languages uh, and the way in which you frame a story. And what Beit Salem have done is that they have uh, they have well, in my opinion, they they've created a a more accurate framing, you know, and they have chosen chosen words that describe the true reality of what's going on rather than a kind of fictional reality that you know uses the language like you know the Jewish democratic state of Israel that's that's the most you know open and fair um, yeah. and just place you can imagine it's kind of a south african model right truth and reconciliation truth and then reconciliation i mean it, yeah. i mean they go hand in hand but there is a there, there, there's a certain order, right? And and yeah. you, can't, you can't base a reconciliation on a on on a false reality. No, that's absolutely that's absolutely right, Mike. And 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 I, and I, and I, and I think that that that's why um, you know you don't. And, and again, you know, they talk about peace and you know peace and justice. Actually, you know, kind of you have to deal with the justice issues before you're going to get peace. You know, there there, there often is a, a a correct order to the language that you use. When we've talked in the past, Robert, when you were here and uh, before, uh, one of the things that you do in your analysis that I really respect and appreciate is 
dissect Zionism to its various parts. So naturally, you know, you 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 know a little bit about Christian Zionism in uh, um, the churches of the religious right. Um, but one of your strengths, I think, is how you discuss and dissect liberal Zionism, not only in its narrow theological forms, but as a part of the larger neoliberal political and economic order too. In fact, you know, what's interesting, what I found interesting is that one of the, one of the uh, signatories of the Jerusalem Declaration is Peter Beinert. And, I, and, I, and, and so I'm wondering what you think about him. What do you think about liberal Zionism? I mean, the, you know, Peter Beinert has become kind of an enigma. He doesn't go far enough for most of us. And yet there are others who appreciate the movement he's taken. I don't want your answer to be completely about him, but he becomes kind of, he's kind of a, an example, isn't he, of this, of this movement that's taking place. So talk a little bit about Beinert and liberal Zionism, both. Yeah, well, um, I mean, P Peter Beinert, I mean, I've kind of been following him for the last, you know, 10 or more years. And, and yeah, he's, he's a man on a journey. Uh, and it's very interesting to see how 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 he's moving along that journey, uh, and the experiences that he's having, uh, and then the kind of you know the criticism that he's met on this later stage, where he's finally kind of you know I'm giving up on the two state solution, and uh, and he's now defining Zionism in in a way that most people wouldn't wouldn't actually uh, understand as Zionism these days. He's kind of harking back to. People like uh, Hadam, who was a you know a kind of cultural Zionist, who was a uh, kind of intellectual counterweight to Theodore Herzl. Um, uh, I know this is where P Peter Beinart is trying to kind of locate himself. So he's trying to sort of hang on to a um, uh, some sort of definition of Zionism, so that he can kind of hang on to that word Just in the hope that it gives him liberty. He can't quite <laughs> he can't quite let it go. So he's trying to sort of hark back to earlier understandings of uh, or, or competing understandings of Zionism that lost out, you know, that kind of ultimately have, have turned out to be um, irrelevant, however much, you know, you might want to uh, um, uh, feel good about them. Um, so, yeah, so that uh, Peter Beinart, uh, I, I, he's an important figure. Um, I think he's highly influential. Um, he's got, he's, again, he's one of these scholars that's got credibility. He's not easy. He's not so easy to dismiss. Uh, and I usually I usually refer to him as you know the only liberal Zionist worth, worth listening to. Ah, oh, okay. Um, uh, uh, and um, in terms of sort of liberal Zionism more more broadly, I think it is just this inherent contradiction that's at the heart of it. You know, this idea of liberal and and liberal Zionism in the context of where Zionism and where the state of Israel has ultimately got to today. Um, so, you know, you can talk about all sorts of other kind of, if you like, sort of softer, milder versions of, of Zionism that were that were discussed and understood in earlier decades or pre-1948. Um, but, you know, the reality is the Zionism that currently exists. Um, and that's what you have to kind of, yeah. that's what you have to respond to. Uh, and and you know, I, I would have described myself as a liberal Zionist growing up and as a you know as a sort of young man you know um and it took me a long time to kind of be able to let go of that uh so i do you know i i, I understand where where people are when when they still want to kind of describe themselves in that way because i've been on that journey and so i don't want to be kind of too hard on them because i think you know it's like being hard on myself um you know i guess i having made the uh, having kind of made the journey and kind of got to the other side being able to let go of that liberal Zionist conception um, I'm impatient for other people to do the same um, but I have to kind of respect the fact that people have to kind of get there on their own terms and in their own way uh, but I guess what I hope is that you know, the kind of things that I write and the, the way that I talk might help people make the journey a little bit faster than, than I did myself you know that's my you know that's my hope because often I feel like I, you know, I feel like I am writing to uh to address a younger version of myself i, pr I appreciate that uh that, that personal note uh robert um the i want to want you to just say a brief word um to us over on this side of the pond here uh about uh jeremy corbyn 
a former labor leader, uh, uh, has created his uh, peace and justice project. I was in on the uh, call when they launched when he launched this project uh, a couple months ago. Um, it focuses on poverty, inequality, and unaccountable corporate power, promoting peace, global cooperation, climate justice, self determination, democracy, and human rights. So, like I said, I was on the Zoom call when they launched. Uh, when, when Jeremy launched his Peace and Justice project, uh, it's very similar to uh, here in this country, uh, the Poor People's Campaign um, and its emphases. So uh, Jeremy Corbyn has been uncowed by those in the press and politics who for their own political and even personal purposes have accused him of anti-Semitism. You've written about him, Robert. Uh, tell us a little bit about Jeremy Corbyn in, in his work? Yeah, well, um, I, I, I did write several pieces during the, during the time that he was leader of the Labour Party, uh, because um, from where I was standing, from what I was seeing, I, I thought he was being personally um, uh, um, grossly maligned, uh, and, and the, the criticisms of anti-Semitism um, I, I, I just was not convinced that the, uh, that the problem was as, uh, as great as it was being presented as. Now, I'm not saying that there is no anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, uh, whether it was under Corbyn or before Corbyn or after Corbyn. Um, but uh, it, it felt to me as if uh, there was a, um, a concerted effort, an organised campaign, uh, to try and destabilise his leadership of the Labour Party. Uh, and I think that was driven by concerns about his kind of pro-Palestinian positions. Uh, and, uh, and so that's why, you know, that's why I wrote about it over the years that he was Labour leader. And often I was kind of, the people I was trying to critique were either the, the Jewish press in the UK or particular prominent uh, Jewish leaders like our current chief rabbi, um, Ephraim Mervis, or the, our previous chief rabbi uh, recently died, Jonathan Sachs, you know, who, who were kind of leading this critique of, of, of Corbyn uh, and branding the entire kind of Labour Party and the Labour movement as being somehow, you know, institutionally anti-Semitic. Uh, and I, I, didn't want to accept that, and I thought you know, that he 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 needs defending, and plenty of people stepped up and wanted to defend him, um, and, and not you know, and they kind of often paid a price for it. Um, I'm looking forward to your article uh, uh, about uh, his peace and justice project. <laughs> <laughs> it's really it's really quite a, a, an initiative and he had people from all over the world uh, speaking when he launched it uh, a few months ago. I, I know that our time is short. Uh, I want you to say a word about uh, the recent uh, uh, election in Israel. Our friend uh, Jonathan Cook, writing for the Electronic Intifada, has identified some of the main takeaways of the recent uh, election in Israel. Number one, Netanyahu is the only likely prime minister. Number two, the Kahanis, Israel's version of the Ku Klux Klan, triumphed. Number three, the Israel left had minor gains by ignoring Palestinians. And number four, Netanyahu split the Arab parties, making Palestinians largely irrelevant in the elections. So you can jump into any one of those or, or give us your own take, Robert. But what do you um, think? That's a pretty good summary from Jonathan Cook. Um, <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think there's anything to disagree on that. I mean, I've kind of, I've, I've um, uh, a couple of things. I, I long ago realised that you know that there's there's no point trying to sort of second guess the outcome of Israeli elections. Um, and and the other the other the other thing that I've I've learned is is just um, yeah, Netanyahu seems to win even when he loses. Which is a kind of strange state of affairs, um, and and how politics in Israel seems to be just structured around either pro Netanyahu or anti Netanyahu, with them not a great deal of kind of substance sitting underneath that in terms of you know broader policy agendas. It's just about who you're going to form a coalition with, 
or who are you willing to make alliances with to either allow Netanyahu to continue or to stop Netanyahu? Um, but in but in terms of a kind of you know a deeper conversation about you know the the, the direction of the country or or whether anybody cares about any kind of solution to the Palestinian situation or not, you know, that doesn't get much or, or indeed any um, airtime. So, um, yeah, they're always just kind of, the, the Israeli elections have become very sort of depressing affairs and, 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 we're, and it looks like we're probably going to get another one fairly soon. I uh, was on a Zoom call just the other day with uh, Rifat Cassis and a couple of other Palestinian friends from the Bethlehem area. And uh, they said, yeah, uh, it, it wasn't even on their radar screen. I mean, you know, uh, come see, come saw, as my father would have said, yeah. it doesn't matter either way, right? Uh, yeah. The, the, the situation for Palestinians would remain the same. So, uh, yeah. And even those that followed. I think what's odd, I mean, certainly in the UK, uh, um, you know, uh, for us to understand here is that even those parties which um, present themselves as being on the centre or the centre left, you know, it's it's not my understanding of what centre left or, 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 or looks like. You know, they're all effectively right wing parties. You know, and 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 even those that present themselves in more sort of moderate clothing, um, I don't think they've got anything of relevance or interesting interest to say in terms of the, the Israel Palestine situation. I uh, uh, I want to close with uh, two more personal questions, one of which was submitted early on by our friend Jim Harb. Uh, but uh, uh, before I do that, I want to encourage all of you who are listening today, right now for, at two o'clock this afternoon, Eastern time during this call, many representatives from the, the denominational uh, uh, groups have been meeting in their own Zoom meeting, trying to uh, uh, put together a joint initiative to address the home demolitions in Sheikh Jarrah in Jerusalem and also the Silwan neighborhood in Jerusalem. That call took place from two to three today. And so you'll wanna check with your denominational representatives, your various pin groups, for example, uh, because uh, um, they may have some uh, um, uh, letter writing or emails or some sort of initiative that you might wanna take advantage of uh, with regard to your congressional representatives. So I just want to encourage you to be in touch with those folks. So uh, to close uh, with these last two questions, um, Robert, can you say a little bit more about your MA and what, what are you specifically studying and researching? Uh, well, um, specifically, it, it's uh, an MA in uh, International Conflict and Peace Studies. Uh, and, and as you, as you'll, I'm sure you know, with with MAs, you, you have quite a bit of freedom around, you know, your your um, your actual kind of essay subjects and dissertation. Uh, and, and I've kind of um, chosen to focus a lot, you know, all my essays and my my final dissertation on, on Israel Palestine issues. So uh, uh, this afternoon, I've been writing an essay looking at um, religion and violence, uh, uh, with a specifically about um, Baruch. Goldstein and the Hebron massacre in in 1994. You know, I was last week. I was writing an essay about the the, the background to Israel's nuclear uh, story, its nuclear weapons, and trying to set that in the context of the Holocaust and how the Holocaust determined, uh, particularly you know, Ben Gurion's thinking on these issues. So, 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 yeah, I'm kind of um, uh, it's it's a great privilege that I've got at the moment to be able to have this bit of time. Uh, and to have uh, the opportunity to do some kind of serious study and to get a bit more deeply into some of the books that you know I've looked at in the past or maybe didn't look at quite carefully enough, but um, I'm, I'm enjoying it. And maybe uh, to close the, with a, a question that combines the personal and the political, as, as you know, because you're observant, we are in the middle of Passover and uh, uh, we see here uh, from our friends in Jewish Voice for Peace and others, uh, various uh, anti-Zionist liturgies that hold up not only uh, the liberation of uh, uh, the Hebrew people, Jews from Egypt in the Hebrew Bible, but also uh, the liberation struggles of the indigenous peoples, of uh, our LGBTQ friends, of Palestinians, uh, black and brown lives, etc. 
So I guess I just want to ask you, how, how are you celebrating Passover uh, this year, in, including your passion for Palestinian justice? Well, we, ha we had our uh, family Seder on, um, on the first night of Passover on, on, on Saturday evening. And it was a, for the second year in a row, it was a kind of zo a Zoom affair in that uh, our, our three older children live, live together in, in, in Leeds, which is about an hour and a half from where, where I'm living in, uh, in North Yorkshire. So it's myself and Anne and our younger, uh, our younger son, uh, he's called Micah, by the way. Uh, and uh, we were kind of zooming in with our older kids uh, and a couple of their friends that are all together in the house that they are. And uh, as usual, um, I, I was I had put together um, a liturgy for our Seder service that I have kind of uh, borrowed and stolen from a number of uh, other sources. And and in particular, um, I'm. I'm um, I'm very happy to kind of promote the work that Rabbi Brant Rosen has been doing in the last few years. And, and he does that as part of the Jewish Voice for Peace uh, Rabbinical Council uh, and the work that they have done in creating a uh, new liturgy uh, and centering that liturgy uh, very much within Jewish tradition, but finding ways to connect to, uh, to many other people and many other uh, examples of oppression. Uh, but, but all the time kind of coming at it from that kind of central Exodus story and Exodus theology that's so, that has so uh, uh, dominated Jewish thinking through the millennium. Um, and um, through Brandt's work in particular, you know, we were able to both talk about what the, how the Exodus has related to COVID-19 around the world, um, but also how, how it continues to relate to the Palestinian situation. So uh, yeah, we we I, I'm looking forward to having a Passover Seder next year when I've got you know, all my kids in in the same room though. <laughs> Brant uh, uh, has been an advisor and close friend of Indiana Center for Middle East Peace. He's been here to Fort Wayne three different times, and uh, we consider him a very close friend. I'm going to let Robert have the last word, but before I do, let me just share this here. This Saturday, April the 3rd, we're co-sponsoring with many other organizations, the Easter service hosted by Friends of Sabeel with uh, our friends, Jean Zaru, Nora Carmi, Sabeel's Father Naima Teek, and a sermon by Reverend William Barber of the Poor People's Campaign. That's this Saturday, uh, 9 a.m. Uh, Pacific time, 12 noon Eastern time. I don't have the link here, uh, but if you check on the FOSNA website, uh, they'll have a link where you can register. And then also on Wednesday, April the 7th at 1 o'clock Eastern Time, notice not 2, but 1 o'clock Eastern Time, we'll be talking with our good friend Daoud Nasser from Tent of Nations. You know if you've received their latest newsletter that they're under increasing pressure not only from the Israeli government and, and the neighboring settlers, but also from uh, local Palestinian villagers in Nahalin, which is right below them in the valley. So uh, you'll wanna join for an update. It's not just Daoud giving his regular talk that he's given all around the country, but we're gonna be interviewing him, specifically asking him to update us on these various aspects of the siege of Tent of Nations by these various forces. Um, uh, of course, as you know, the motto of Tent of Nations is, we refuse to be enemies. Please note uh, that this uh, interview with Robert will be on our Indiana Center for Middle East Peace YouTube channel in just a couple of days. So we hope you'll share the news of our interviews with your friends. Robert, thank you for joining us today. Any parting words for us? I just want to say thank you again for the invitation. Uh, the last hour has gone very quickly. I think that's, um, hopefully um, it has for other people as well, but I've really enjoyed talking to you again, Mike. Um, and, and I just want to thank you and the, and the work that the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace has been doing uh, and the great events that I can see you've got coming up. Um, it's, a, it's a really impressive program that you keep doing um, and um, this all, all strength to you. Um, but, sorry. Please. 
No, I mean, you know, my final my final thoughts about you know, it's very easy to become, uh, I think, sort of you know, a little bit despondent uh, and and a little bit sort of um, disheartened when it comes to Israel Palestine. And I know uh, you and the people who are, are watching this have probably been kind of you know campaigning and working on this for 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 decades, far longer than I have. Um, uh, and I, and I think we we have to kind of keep up our strength. Uh, and realise that even if uh, in the short term things don't seem particularly hopeful, there are always signs, there are always things happening that can make us think, you know, this, there is the possibility, there is the, even the likelihood that this thing will ultimately turn around and be very different. And I, and I, and I often look to the United States to find those hopeful signs and I see it in Jewish Voice for Peace and I see it in If Not Now and I see it in what's happening in the the base of the Democratic Party and some of the great Congress people that uh, are now in, a, in the House. Um, and for me, those are signs that, you know, the tectonic plates are slowly changing uh, and, and there is movement and we, we all just have to kind of keep on in there. And if, if Palestinians themselves can keep their steadfastness on this issue, um, then, then our, I think we can do the same. I just want to repeat. Thank you, Robert. I just want to uh, repeat for you this wonderful comment from our friend, uh, a wonderful activist for many, many years, Nusheen Framke, who says, just love this comment about writing to a younger version of yourself. Beinert's on a journey and it's slow and arduous. Robert sees that pain because he's gone through it himself, but is further down the road now. So I just wanted to make sure that, Robert, you saw that word of affirmation from Nusheen. Thank you. That's very, very kind words. Uh, and thank you all for joining us today.